Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we are having an East Bay Regional Park District fireside chat with our general manager, Bob Doyle, and uh, the 11th District Congressional member, uh, Congressman Mark DeSalme. And today we're gonna to have a chance to talk a little bit about the environment, uh, parks, and two of the items I'd like to begin with would uh, are active transportation and the Naval Weapons Station in Concord progress. So first, active transportation. So that talks about the paved regional trails that the park district has. And we have 225 miles of these trails, which stitch communities together throughout the East Bay. And in Congressman DeSalne's area, we have a little bit of the Delta De Anza Trail, the Contra Costa Canal Trail, Iron Horse Regional Trail, and the Lafayette Moraga Trail. These are very popular, particularly in this time of COVID with people wanting to get out and exercise. And they walk, uh, some people skate, people walk with their dogs, ride bicycles. And these are trails which draw millions of people to them every year. Once they discover them, they never turn back. The other thing I'd like to talk about just a little bit is the Naval Weapons Station Concord. This base closed in, in the inland area in 2005. And the entire inland area is 5,000 acres. So as many people know, half of it will be developed and that is under the purview of Concord, the city. The other half, 2,500 acres is a brand new regional park. I can't tell you how exciting that is for those who visit the park district, but also for people who realize that that whole Eastern part of the Diablo Valley, including those hills that you, you see and which are yellow, as you can see behind me today, um, provide open space and a wildlife corridor practically from the water to Mount Diablo. So in 2019, the district received the uh, land from the Navy as a con um, beneficial conveyance from the National Park Service. And that was a um, great celebration for us, followed this year by the Park District adopting a land use plan, which we'll discuss how it will be used. The, um, we're still discussing what the final name of the park will be, uh, but we do know for sure that the visitor center in this park is going to be a significant landmark and destination for people throughout the East Bay. And that visitor center will allow us to tell the stories that have happened there from the Chupcon Indians homeland, Mexican ranchos, agriculture, the military, and the Port Chicago explosion in 1944. So people will have a location where they can finally come and talk about that part of their very important history. So uh, with that, I, for the Park District and myself, I want to express my gratitude to the public and the staff uh, and my appreciation for them and wish everybody a happy holiday. And as you come and use the park district, please remember the usual, physically distance, wear a mask, put your dogs on leash, leave no trace and figure out what you're gonna do before you come by going to the East Bay Regional Park District's website, ebparks.org. So next, I'd like to introduce my friend and colleague, Colin Coffey, who is on the board and represents uh, the Contra Costas Ward 7. Colin, you're up. Thank you, Beverly Lane. And thank you all for joining the Park District's fireside chat today with our general manager, Robert E. Doyle and Congress member, Mark DeSonier. 
I am Park District Board Member Colin Coffey of Park District Ward 7. Today we get the chance to hear from two of the foremost leaders of environmental and open space advocacy in the East Bay. It is a casual discussion addressing critical local issues of this year 2020 and on into the coming year. This discussion will include the emergence during COVID of parks as essential and critical for our mental and physical health, as well as after a couple of horrendous fire seasons, a discussion of wildfire protection and climate change. You know, East Bay usage continues uh, to soar in our parks. Park visitation has increased by an estimated 30%, which translates to an additional 7.5 million visits in 2020. This surge in visitation is matched with increased risks for the Park District's 580 person field staff. Park District frontline staff have been provided all necessary personal protective equipment as they work daily to keep the parks and trails open and safe. Every daily task for Park District staff has been redesigned to assure staff and park user safety, including cleaning restrooms, sanitation generally, sewer pumping, construction and maintenance trades jobs, also vehicle maintenance, animal and aquarium care at our farms and visitor centers, removing park waste and recyclable materials, maintaining visitor facilities, providing public, public education on new safety protocols and protecting natural habitat. Of interest, the Park District conducted a scientific survey recently of residents of Alameda and Contra Costa counties. And what did we find? 96% say the accessibility of parks and trails play an important role in maintaining the mental health of our community. 81% say that they consider the East Bay Regional Park District to be an essential service. 96% believe that now more than ever, parks and trails must remain open and accessible so people have the opportunity to be outside and get physical exercise in a safe, socially distant manner. Finally, 89% believe the Park District should consider expanding its youth summer jobs program, and they would be willing to support this effort with modest new taxes. Another critical East Bay issue these two deeply knowledgeable leaders discuss is wildfire protection and climate change. California's 2020 fire season has been the worst on record with more than 4 million acres across this state burned, including five major wildfires in our local regional parks. Uh, thanks to Chief Eileen Tiley and her crew, the Park District Fire Department is an East Bay leader in wildfire management and rapid fire response. Our 50 plus member fire department aided by a helicopter monitor and fight wildfires and conduct water drops throughout the Bay Area during fire seasons. We use sophisticated monitoring equipment to evaluate weather and wildfire conditions to determine park user restrictions based on the data we collect. We also use work crews, advanced equipment, and you know, good old fashioned cattle, sheep, and goat grazing to thin and remove hazardous vegetation throughout the year. The Park District will continue to advocate for ways to support our park staff. And we thank Congress Member Mark DeSonye for his continuous advocacy for and recognition that parks are essential. We especially thank him for his advocacy for Park District eligibility for congressional coronavirus relief funding. The Park District thanks the public for taking the extra steps necessary to stay safe for themselves and our park employees while visiting the regional parks and trails. And now I'm sure you will enjoy this conversation with General Manager Robert Doyle and Congress Member Mark DeSonye. Good afternoon, Mr. Congressman. Good afternoon, Mr. General Manager. How are you doing? I'm good, excellent, thank you for asking. We're all very happy to hear that. And we hope you and your family are doing well. We are. Well, Mark, we've known each other for quite a while and um, we've, been, we've seen a lot. We've seen a lot. Uh, that beautiful mountain behind you is probably three times bigger in size for state parks and regional parks. And uh, that's been a favorite place of both of ours, hasn't it? It sure has. 
I've run all over that mountain. Not so much recently, but over the years, yes. Somebody accused me of walking slowly, and I, I said it is sauntering. It's called saunter. Right. When you enjoy nature, it's not slow, it's saunter. <laughs> well, a famous Contra Costin said that. That's right. John Muir, he's going sauntering. Well, Mark, you've been involved, uh, speaking of hiking and walking, you've been involved for a long time in um, uh, trails and transportation. And so uh, we've had a very successful time in Contra Costa and Alameda County Bowl um, with building a trail system that started as a recreational system simply for connecting people to parks. And today, uh, with people like you supporting the need to get people out of cars and walking and healthy and bicycle riding, we now, it's really a green transportation system. Absolutely. And it's, it's so wonderful. We inherited, um, you and I, a wonderful um, inheritance from the people who preceded us in our jobs and in the community. And uh, it's put a certain amount of um, pressure on us, responsibility to continue that tradition. And I, I hope that future generations will look back at both of our services and, and have um, a similar respect for what we were able to do as our predecessors did. And I, I think it's important to realize that it's hard to look far enough out in the future when you're dealing with all the problems of today. Uh, when the park district started building its trail system and I started working on that trail system, um, we really, we're talking about an eight foot wide trail. Mm -hmm. uh, some of it was barely paved. And today uh, in some places it's, it's over 15, sometimes even wider uh, because of the traffic volumes. We never expected um, that type of traffic uh, when we were doing recreational planning. And now we just realize how critical that foresight was to take the Contra Costa Canal and make that a 12 mile uh, loop through the valley to connect into eastern Contra Costa County on that all the way to the Delta and the Iron Horse Trail, which goes from Concord to Livermore. And so those have become, we have over a million people a year now using the Iron Horse Trail. It's a transportation system. And we're now getting the complaints of what happened to the recreation. Everybody wants to just get to the store, the school and the work. And that's a good thing though. We're, we're very proud of that. Yeah, I think the integration in what am I trying to say? Integrating all, integrating all this is so important. So in everybody's daily life, I, I know um, when I was running long distances and training for marathons on your trails and on uh, the state parks, particularly Mount Diablo, there were moments when I'd see more people out there and go, ah, geez, I really like the solitude of this. But on the other hand, more people enjoying it is it benefits everybody. Um, and the recreational aspect, I think, sort of um, doesn't do full service to the importance of it, both from an infrastructure standpoint um, and from a spiritual standpoint. I mean, there's nothing like getting out in nature, as, as John Muir would say, and as the Native Americans who um, love this area would tell us as well. Well, the first transportation, obviously, was always on foot. Yeah. And probably horse or wagon than horse or horse than wagon. And, uh, you know, what we're really trying to do now that is the, the challenge and the opportunity is that last mile connection right. to transportation hubs, buses, BART. Um, you were a leader in the uh, Pleasant Hill BART station uh, corridor of the old SP right of way. And we worked together to get an overcrossing of Treat Boulevard, one of our first bridges. Now there's a right. half dozen but also to make that a, a linear park. And right. it was your, your effort to do that. And uh, today it's just with all the new higher density housing coming in, that's their front yard park. So it really serves many purposes, but the challenge now are these last miles who mm -hmm. cost a lot of money to get through places where they weren't planned to have bicycle pedestrian access. And we're, we're, making, we're making progress. Yeah, you know, one of the funny things for you and I, as you look back on your career um, and your lives, not to be morbid about it, but you, um, you reflect on whether you had a difference or not. One of my favorite places to go and drive down Treat Boulevard is uh, 
that park by the Robert Schroeder, uh, again, named after a predecessor uh, on the Board of Supervisors who helped this, that beautiful bridge. Um, but that used to be a parking lot, if you remember. Um, the county put uh, 600 spaces in there to help in the interim with the, the development. Uh, my predecessor on the Board of Supervisors, Sonny McPeak, along with uh, supervisor, then Supervisor uh, Schroeder put that in. And it was a great joy to me to be there for when we took that parking space out and put that park in. Uh, we added the parking spaces the county did at the, at the BART parking garage there. Um, I always like to joke to my kids that when we would drive by there, I'd say, listen, look, Joni Mitchell complained about, we turned, we, we turned open space into a parking lot we were able there to do the opposite uh, and really um, still allowed for people to get there in their automobiles and a parking space. But then again, that integration, what I was trying to say earlier, um, so that you have the multimodal uh, ability to, to connect uh, within a whole region. So that was really important. That area, as you know, uh, maybe some of our viewers didn't know, was uh, one of these pockets of unincorporated areas. So the municipal government was um, the County Board of Supervisors. And we, that census track um, used to be, I don't know if this is still the case, uh, the most high uh, density transit ridership that census track around, which is an indicator that we did it right, that people chose to live there and work there because of the connection, they, the connections to both heavy rail, um, bus, and most importantly for us, that, that trail system. Well, you know, when we first started looking at uh, at those trails, we were able to um, convince people that they should spend the money on it. That Treat Boulevard overcrossing, which I think we have a slide here too, was very expensive at the time. And we had to justify it uh, because it was stopping traffic. So many people were pushing the button at the intersection, the traffic right. would be idled, only air pollution and a lack of traffic movement. So. We're very proud of this bridge and of that section of trail as well as the other trails. Well, the public, as you remember, um, got to vote on different styles. And so it was a terrific project all the way around. And it's, it's really terrific to look at it now and see the usage it gets and the aesthetics of it. I, I'm very proud of um, my role in that, that whole development. The county staff was great. Jim Kennedy, our redevelopment director, um, just really uh, all the board members I work with, uh, Donna Gerber, Bob Schroeder. Um, so just really a great collaboration that now people get to enjoy on, in multiple ways. And that, that bridge in that picture you just saw was the last remaining bridge on the SP right-of-way. It was gonna be sold for scrap metal and the district purchased it in the evening before it was sold and now it's been converted to the trail bridge. So a little bit of history there. Yeah, really terrific. You know, and, and um, Bobby, you know, for those of us who have been fortunate enough to travel in our lives, uh, both personally and professionally, um, you know, when you go to more urban areas in my career, it was always at the Bay Area. When I first moved to the Bay Area, I didn't date myself in the 70s from Boston, um, we knew that we had land, but we wanted to protect um, the open space in that land, but develop the land in such a way that uh, people would want to live there. And of course, it's become so popular, our housing costs are now a real challenge. Um, but this knowing we're going to urbanize and looking at places like London and Paris and uh, Tokyo and, and, and cities that were more urban than us, um, you knew that the successful ones, New York, um, were good at predicting the urbanization and creating this open space and the integration so that you could walk, um, you could take rail, you had a, a rail system um, that people want to take um, and you could use pedestrian. But one of those trips I took, I was able to get a couple of German Marshall Fund grants um, and uh, you go to um, Amsterdam, um, Copenhagen, and over 50% of the trips in those cities for those people who've been there actually are by bikes, uh, they're multimodal. If you get off the rail station in Amsterdam, there's not a parking garage there for cars. There's a huge multi, multi-level parking garage for bikes and people leave their bikes there. So all of those things we, we learn from people 
were ahead of us. Uh, and then we learned uh, from other places in the country, but also from our predecessors who had the vision to create the East Bay Regional Park District. Um, so all of those things have really been terrific to see um, come to their fruition. And then the challenges we have where people who want to live here, but cost of living is, is too high. So um, we leave some challenges for future generations. So your picture is a good description behind you, your screen. Um, that's Briones Regional Park in Mount Diablo in the background. And to think that all those trails connect those two parks mm -hmm. and uh, that you don't realize that there's 300,000 people living underneath that little fog belt in there. And just to, the, uh, just to the north of that is another great project that we both worked on for a long time. And that is the former Conquer Naval Weapons Station. We, in, in the interim, we call the park portion we just received um, an area bigger than Tilden Park in Oakland, 2,500 acres. Sure. We just received that this year. And I, I'll, I'll chide you a little bit because this went through Ellen Tauscher, uh, John Garamendi, uh, and George Miller, and somehow you brought it home. I don't, you know, you 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 really uh, you you won the race, Mark, and uh, it's going to be an incredible legacy to have a park there. No, it's amazing. Um, actually, I when I got elected to the Concord City Council in 1990, I think 89. Um, as you know, I owned a restaurant named after Teddy Roosevelt because amongst the other things I admired in Teddy Roosevelt was. Uh, really our first environmental naturalist president, president, uh, first president who came to the, came to California, met with John Muir, um, famous picture of he and John Muir on top of um, Half Dome in Yosemite. So at that restaurant, TRs, after I got elected, shortly after a month or two, George Miller came in, Congressman Miller, and he pulled me aside and he said, you know, um, and at the time the weapons station uh, had, I think a thousand jobs out there, was very active. And Congressman Miller said to me, he said, you know, we've been waiting for a local elected official to ask the Department of Defense and their member of Congress, meaning him at the time, um, how much longer they might need all of that property because the Department of Defense's mission was changing um, and that was clearly going to change. So I went to the Contra Costa Times and I publicly said, you know, now that I'm here, um, I think it's time to start thinking about the future of the Concord Dampa Weapons Station long lost, except for a few of us. Um, some of the people who worked out there didn't like me for that, uh, but it's been a terrific project. It's such an amazing um, piece of property and an opportunity again for future generations. And um, the city of Concord worked with the, with the neighbors um, and really engaged the community. And it's been not without its challenges, but to be expected of a project of that size and to get it right and maintain a very high quality. Well, we're, we're very excited about the opportunities in that new park uh, to work with the National Park Service. In fact, uh, one of uh, President Obama's first pieces of legislation uh, was to declare um, the Port Chicago Memorial National Park site and to work with the park district on a future uh, uh, interpretive center, visitor center there, which we've already located and planned um, it's going to take a lot of money to do that, but we're really recycling a building. Um, it's not a new building. We're talking about recycling a building. And uh, I have the, the pleasure. I grew up three blocks from the weapon station. My brother worked there and my father worked there. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's a long, a long history um, that we are looking across that fence going, what's over there? <laughs> and, uh, so it, it's just really remarkable. And I, and I think in the end, about half will be developed for much needed economic growth and housing and half will be a regional park. And I think that's a good example of both environmental mitigation and, and the needs of society. Um, there's a lot of work that has to be done there, um, but there's a lot of opportunities with roads and railroad beds as trails, even the bunkers, some of them can be used as maybe picnic areas and displays, but as you're very aware of and, and very concerned about, this was also the site on the shoreline of the terrible tragedy um, for the, the black workers, the back, black sailors working in ter terrible conditions, trying to get all that ammunition out to the front lines and that, that terrible explosion. And so the opportunity to both have the park district do what it does, which is recreation and parks, 
And the greatest, I think you've heard this many times, the greatest storyteller in the nation is the National Park Service. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that that's it's just a great opportunity. We hope that Congress and citizens will support getting that visitor center that can tell the stories for national parks and regional parks and nature and our indigenous people. Um, this was all native uh, for our first Americans, our indigenous people was all uh, had lived in an environment rich in uh, natural resources and natural beauty. And um, from everything, I, I remind people that every drop um, that goes through that on Mount Diablo Creek starts at the top of Mount Diablo and drains into Mitchell Creek and Donner Creek and Back Creek and goes through Concord and goes all the way out to the bay. You've got an entire ribbon ecosystem of that creek and we're hoping to see that restored. Yeah, and I think um, the story of what happened at Port Chicago and um, the Port Chicago 50, and of course there's a wonderful book about this that uh, is very illuminating and wonderful timing, I think, given um, the real movement in this country to uh, for reconciliation about um, this country's role uh, towards African Americans, also to you know, the indigenous population. So, what happened there? Um, you know, we Californians and Bay Area folks tend to think, and Americans, unfortunately, but we tend to think um, uh, issues of race and segregation happen somewhere else. And as Barbara Lee will tell you, no. They happened here. Uh, they continue to happen here, in my view, uh, in terms of prejudice and bias. And this is a wonderful opportunity, I think, uh, for the Bay Area to tell uh, uh, an amazing American story, both its tragedy and its failure, but also, um, you know, uh, the, it, the, the liberating, forceful um, individuals who decided uh, that this wasn't good enough, that we had to reconcile. Um, our weaknesses and our, our prejudice in this case uh, with what we hope for in the future and where we live today. So as, as you know, Thurgood Marshall as a young man actually came out to defend those, the Port Chicago 50 and had a wonderful line that I, I love. He, he said in the court um, that was the trial was at Treasure Island. He said, I came here not just to defend these 50 Americans um, who are innocent, in my belief, but to defend the words and aspirations in our sacred creed, meaning the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, it gives me goosebumps. So all of that again is an integration over multiple generations, and we're going to celebrate it, um, as you said, at, at uh, Port Chicago and at Concord Naval Weapons Station, former Concord Naval Weapons. Well, Station. I think there's a real opportunity um, if we can all figure out a way to, to restore this building and provide the access to it. There's a lot of stories here at Concord. Um, and as you mentioned, but it's also a place where there were peace protesters during the Vietnam War. That, that's a story that is an important story to tell too. Um, and the agricultural, you know, Central Contra Costa was called the Garden of the Gods. It was full of streams and water and fish and ducks, but also incredibly rich agriculture. So that all those stories can come from that, that type of a place. I, I particularly was during the, um, during the different people who spoke in the planning process, it really impacted our staff at the district to realize that a lot of young black people didn't even know the story. Um, they'd heard about it as if it was a far off place yet it was right here. Um, and I think uh, being the largest tragedy, you know, uh, continental side tragedy during the war of an explosion um, that people have heard about that, uh, but they haven't heard the whole story. And right. this would be a place uh, working with the great storytellers in the park district and the national parks to tell all those stories. And I think it's, it's a real opportunity for education and coming to grips with some things. So yeah, and, and important in all of that story, the the the, the segregation, the white officers, um, and the African American sailors who wanted to contribute to the war effort in World War II, um, and then uh, having to load uh, munitions in a very unsafe way, very different from their um, white uh, compatriots who were the Teamsters who were doing similar work, and then um, because of what happened there. Uh, in no small part, Harry Truman decided to desegregate the military. So wonderful um, first reconciliation and recognition of what went wrong there, but also what happened there led to um, 
us fulfilling our sacred creeds a little bit more. It's just a wonderful, wonderful project. And we're very happy that uh, we have this great um, legislation that required uh, federal agencies when they close a base to look at what portion can come to parks. And we were able to get this through what's called a beneficial conveyance, no cost uh, to get this land. This land is incredibly valuable. Um, and so to be able to do that will really help us move along. And uh, again, our hope is that this is a real great place for current and historic conversations to occur. Um, we've got golden eagles nesting in the trees behind us. It's rich in wildlife and an opportunity to restore a lot of the habitat that may have been, uh, let's say, um, changed during the many years of military operation. Yeah, it's, it's just a great project. And you, uh, what, a, a, what a great collaboration too, with the city, the county, the state, the federal government, and um, the National Park Service and um, you folks at the East Bay Regional Parks, really a, a terrific, terrific project. Who are those two old guys? <laughs> well, you realize that, you know, these things take a long time and you have to be tenacious and you need the citizens to not, you know, let loose of their idea and say, I give up mm -hmm. uh, because it takes a long, long time to do that. So, and, and in that kind of thought, um, you back in Washington, D.T., D.C., going through your health issues back there, and the whole nation now suffering uh, the worst pandemic we, we could ever imagine and still going on in a surge. And what we at the Park District realized, um, and it was our own health departments in the counties who said, you need to keep your parks open. They are essential. People have no other place to go. There was no game in town. There were literally no soccer games, no baseball games, no sports uh, no Warriors games, uh, nothing. And so our parks have seen a tremendous surge in popularity. And our recent surveys that we do with the public showed that people overtly said it wasn't just about my exercise and getting outdoors. It was about my mental health. And I know that you have worked really hard in Congress to talk about mental health and getting more attention paid to people who don't have services for mental health. And I just want to acknowledge the, the overt um, sense of public, public telling us how important parks were for mental health, as well as the great healthy outdoors and beauty that they, they represent. So it's been quite a, quite a year. Uh, we're so happy that uh, we've been allowed and we're able to, with our great workforce, to keep our parks open for the public. And there are people that obviously have never, you know, when you go hiking in flip-flops, probably those people haven't hiked much in the past. <laughs> uh, it's we've, California. <laughs> we've had to do some education, but it's just been great to see the diversity and the popularity of our parks. And uh, we've we've really we've suffered too, but not nearly as much as a nation. Uh, we had a lot of loss of uh, revenue from no weddings and no programs. But our interpretive mm -hmm. services have done a great job of getting school kids uh, environmental education through videos, and we really jumped on that. So I'm very proud of our naturalists. Uh, but this has been quite the year, and I hope um, with the new administration coming on with some really great appointments that really are great scientists and great environmental leaders that, that the importance of health and of parks and recreation will be uh, in the forefront. Yeah, I hope so, too. And I, 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 this, this open space and the integration is so important to people's quality of life. Um, and I really think it, I, I, we know it's spiritual because we've been passed this down to, from Native Americans who are deeply spiritual, um, the Greeks, the Romans. I, I, one of the odd things in my life is I grew up very close to Concord, Massachusetts. And one of my favorite places is uh, Emerson's home. Terrific. If you're ever there, uh, you can go through a tour. And by the back door are his walking uh, canes, his and Thoreau's, where they walked out the back door and walked. Uh, for miles. So to, to revere Emerson in particular, Anthro, and then end up where John Muir um, called home as much as he had a home and where he's buried. Uh, these connections are so important to human beings uh, and our connection to nature. Um, and it's, it's just been so wonderful to work with you. And, and Bob, I, gotta, I really have to say, um, 
you know, this country struggles right now, and we've always been a little bit cynical. Gary Wills wrote a great book about a necessary evil that Americans, the nature of our people who came here, um, didn't trust government and public institutions because of religious biases that they came here for. And his opinion is it has um, worked well for this country. However, it's gone too far and people don't realize, uh, World War II generation they realize because of their life experience, but the public sector um, provides a lot of wonderful people and you're one of them. Um, mm -hmm. You decided to have a career in public service and those things are to be admired. And I admire you and the public needs to know that if it wasn't for people like you um, who and the people who work at East Bay Regional Parks and, and the vast majority of organizations I've been. Of course, when you have human beings, you're gonna have great ones. You're gonna have those of us who struggle and people who are not so great, but by far and away, the public gets a great value from the people who choose to pursue a career in public service. And you're right at the top of that, mind you. So thank you for your career. That's I truly really think that uh, the next challenge we have here, speaking of the public and of public agencies is addressing climate change. I'm so, pleased uh, to see that that's going to be back on the front burner. You know, it's hard to imagine that President Jimmy Carter had solar panels on the White House that were taken uh, down uh, uh, over 40 years ago. And so um, we really, um, I, I truly believe um, as an optimist that we have the tools in our toolbox to, to do uh, and address climate change. Uh, it's not rocket science, it is science. We got a person to the moon. We have the tools if we can scale up. We need a climate army. And I'm not just talking about laborers and good jobs. I'm talking about scientists and biologists and naturalists and engineers, you know, transportation engineers to work in our public lands so we don't have such a devastating fires. So we don't lose our shoreline or even our airports. And so I, I think we have the tools, but we need a climate army uh, like the WPA or the CCCs did with uh, back in the 30s and 40s where they built the parks. They literally built the parks. Yeah. And there's a huge amount of work in historic preservation. Again, educating young people. They don't have to be a ranger. They don't have to be a laborer. But they may want to be a historian and, and help restore a, a national site or a state site on some history. We have that in, you know, in this county as well. So... I, I just hope that with the, the new effort by the administration and Congress, uh, and I hope that people will see that this is an economic opportunity, not just for the jobs, which are really critical for young people to get skills, but for the education of training. Yeah. Um, and I, I just, I, I'm just very hopeful. I think people were overwhelmed by climate and fires and, and, and terrible storms. But I believe we have the tools in our toolbox if we can scale up and really make a commitment to, to hire people, to give them jobs and training to do work. It's a wonderful thing. I, you know, I appreciate your gratitude towards me, but this is the opportunity I had as a kid is to learn yeah. skills. And, um, and, and it's been a great career and a great run and I've had learned so many things. So it's, it's just really wonderful to, uh, to be here in a place where I can make a difference, but we really got to focus on fires. It's not sustainable the way we're doing it. It's too expensive. We've got to recognize that, you know, even the environmental groups sometimes that don't have any more grazing in parks because it's not natural. Well, then everything builds up underneath. Right. Uh, these were fires this summer in our parks, our very, this is Round Valley. And so uh, lightning fires, nobody set this fire on, it was lightning. And so where we are able to stop these fires is in the grassland that we grazed and managed. And managing these parklands is, is a, a long-term effort and they can be, some of the areas should burn. They just haven't burned at all in a hundred years. So it's all built up, but it's not sustainable to address uh, this by just, you know, firefighters out there risking their lives. We need to do a lot more to invest in these natural resources. These resources actually preserve and hold carbon in the ground. Yeah. And, and they're also an opportunity to hire young people. Again, these are our crews still, they worked all during COVID. They responded to fires, they did fuel management. And I'm so proud of our firefighters and our first line responders. 
You know, Bob, I, I just, on the climate change issue, um, something I'm very passionate about. I was on the Air Resources Board in California, very important and wonderful appointment. And California's done remarkable work um, on traditional pollutants, but then on climate, uh, climate change. Um, because of the U.S. Clean Air Act, in spite of this president, uh, we are allowed to go further based on very strict public health policy uh, and findings, uh, which can be challenged in court. So we have led the country in many ways, the world on climate change, but we can't do it alone. And of the many benefits, it's, a, it's been a great benefit economically to California. Uh, we get half of the venture capital in the United States comes to California for renewables and alternative fuels. So I have a project, um, you know, you mentioned Jimmy Carter. Jimmy Carter once famously said, what happens in California happens in the rest of the country. On these kind of things, we provide leadership. The rest of the country um, sometimes gets cranky at us, but also um, follows us. So I've got a project because of our pro progressive uh, environmental stewardship combined with a very heavy footprint in Contra Costa County of four refineries uh, to transition that for the workers, for the climate, um, for all the things you talk about, to do that in such a way as quickly as possible. So we make our contribution and provide uh, a national model, an international model, but also to make sure that the benefits those companies have given to the tax base, to their employees, um, to their contractors, and then for every one job in there it, as a multiplier of 14, we need to make sure we learn from um, West Virginia that we're going to transition those folks into really good high paying jobs. And we've done that on renewables in California. Uh, all, the, all those renewables of solar and wind, um, they've provided really good jobs for um, prevailing wage jobs for and it's worked. So we can do this and provide that leadership. And I'm I'm really looking forward to it, but it combines with um, our dedication to the sacredness to the earth that you you spoke to. And I, uh, we're going to do it here in the East Bay. We're going to provide, continue to provide natural leadership on this, and I this think, issue. And I, I think also that some of the refineries are already switching over. Right, are, they are. And COVID has changed. A way to have that dialogue that we always tend, one side makes the other side the enemy. And I think the refineries have the economic investment in jobs uh, and science that could be very helpful in that, but it is a transition. Um, we have wind uh, energy turbines on some of the park property in East County. And we were the first to hire the scientists to show that you could have wind turbines that kill less birds on bird strikes by collaborating with the wind industry that we could cite them to where yeah. the, the eagles are hunting and they don't hit them anymore. They're taller, they move slower. There are huge opportunities for really smart people, certainly people smarter than me, that, that can come up with these solutions. If you give them the resources and support, we, we can get through this and, and make a better world. I'm not talking about utopia, but it's a pretty darn good place to live in the East Bay. Well, I'd love you to be in your retirement, uh, part of this initiative um, that I've been leading and slowly but surely meeting with employers, employees, environmentalists that I hope to, we hope to kick off um, and we've got legislation uh, so that we will do it here, but that other, um, other communities can do it around the country to transition off of this industrial fossil fuel economy that's benefited humankind uh, for a lot of years but it's past time to transition for the sake of the planet. Um, so I, I'm really excited. I, I hope you'll be part of it. I'd be happy to do that, uh, Mark. And I just think that uh, you've got some fellow Congress members, including John Garamendi and others who've signed on yourself into a uh, conservation core. Yep. I really think the job side of that is an economic stimulus, but it also, as I said, gives young people may have never had the opportunity to learn something, a skill that they're not focused on now. And that's in Congress, that's waiting. And I think uh, very hopeful and wanna stay involved in advocating for that type of legislation to get jobs back out into California and into parks and give young people a chance uh, to have a, a very diverse workforce in the environment, not just in traditional jobs. So I think that's wonderful. A good paying job where you can afford to live in this area 
uh, gives you respect and um, you develop a craft, all those things. Uh, and you do it in such a way that the, the public gets enormous benefits for multiple generations. Good stuff. Well, Mark, thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to talk with you. Stay healthy. Um, I certainly uh, will bug you as much as I can about parks. You know that. Not bugging. It's advocating. <laughs> thank you. You're always you're always very charming, and I know you. I know when you said that story about you growing up by the weapon station on the fence line. I know you were always a perfect angel when you were a young man and never hopped that fence line. Yeah. Ne never, never did anything. Yeah, mm. we'll, we'll yeah. move on from that one. Uh, <laughs> but Mark, want to thank you uh, for your time, for your support of parks and keeping people healthy. You've always been a both health and park advocate. Uh, and I, I just recall that, you know, we don't want to have the early history of the tragedy of the commons. Uh, parks are the commons. They belong to everybody of every background, race, creed color. Um, that's what uh, Frederick Law Olmsted started in, in very industrial New York, saying you need yeah. a park for the general public to have a place that they feel safe and welcome. Yeah. And that's been the philosophy of parks long before all the discussions we're having in these days. So thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. Thank you for your remarkable career. Thank you.